Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and this presentation is going to correspond to section 2.2 of your textbook. So in chapter 2 it's mostly focused on the collection of data and how geologists analyse the data that they collect in the field and in the lab. So to begin with one of the primary ways that a geologist will collect data is by doing field work. So going out into the field and finding outcrops of rock and analysing them. So we're going to begin by thinking about what observations a geologist will collect when you are at one of these outcrops. So the primary goal when observing an outcrop is to try and produce a defendable explanation for the outcrop that you are observing. Your aim is to try and produce a model that explains everything that you can see. So as you can see we have an outcrop here in this picture and we're going to look at some of the basic things that geologists will be looking for when they approach an outcrop like this. So the first thing a geologist is obviously going to look at is we're going to try and identify different rock types in our outcrop. So we can see in this particular image that there are actually four different layers of rock which we can pick out relatively easily. The first sequence is this lower sequence here which has this very distinctive rusty red brown colour to it and we can also see it quite clearly because we have these nice horizontal layers which we refer to in geology as beds. So we can see we have a nice bedded sequence of rocks here which all have these rusty red colours. So that's going to be our first rock type. Now above them we can see we have a change. We go from a layer of rock that has nice horizontal beds to a layer of rock that quite clearly has none. We can also see there's a difference in colour. We're going from a rusty red brown sequence down here to a kind of grey, black, brown rock with a, maybe a slightly purplish tint to it. And so clearly we can see quite obviously that we've gone from one type of rock down here to a new type of rock. So we've got a, a second rock type in our sequence. Now as we continue through this sequence we can see it's pretty featureless in terms of structures. So this means in geology we'll often refer to this type of rock as massive. A massive just simply means a featureless layer. And so we can see we've got this nice bedded sequence down here, then we have this massive layer here, and then you can see we go back into a bedded sequence. This one has a different colour though. This one has a, it's a kind of dark grey black colour to it, um, but once again we can see these nice horizontal beds. So you can see we've clearly transitioned from this layer of rock here to a new layer of rock above it. And then based on the change in colour we can also see there's actually a fourth layer of rock. So we can see this is our fourth layer here and we can pick it out because it has this rather distinctive light grey colour. So you can tell that it's there due to the change in the colour. So a geologist will, when they approach an outcrop, we will look for changes in colour, changes in texture, changes in structures. And that's going to allow us to identify the different layers of rock that we can see in our outcrop. So that's our first goal. Our next goal is to describe the layers of rock. So we'll do it on a big scale and we'll do it on a small scale. So on a big scale we would look at things like how thick is the layer. We would look at things like what's the layer's colour. We would look at what its dip is, what angle is it going into the earth at. We can see that these layers are horizontal, so they're going left to right essentially. But you can have different dips, you can have the layer of rock going into the ground at 45 degrees. So we would make those observations. And then we would make smaller scale observations, so we're getting close to the rock and we'd start looking at, right, what are the minerals in this rock? What are the relationships between these minerals? Can we see any kind of alteration which would tell us that something has happened to the rock after it formed? And so we're going to combine these large and small scale observations to help us identify and classify what these different rocks are. And the next thing we're going to think about are what are the relationships between the rocks. So this is important when it comes to trying to work out how the outcrop formed. So we can quite easily as a geologist work out what the layers of rock are, but the real challenge is trying to come up with a sequence of events that would produce the outcrop that we're looking at. 
Now in this case, this particular sequence is relatively straightforward. We can see that quite clearly this layer of rock down here, the red brown layer, has this massive layer deposited over the top of it. Then we have this layered uh, gray black layer over the top and then we have the light gray layer over the top of that. And so we can see we have a continuous sequence of rocks with this red layer being the oldest, then the massive layer being deposited over the top, then the bedded grey black layer being deposited over the top of that, and then finally the light grey layer being deposited last. And so that's just telling us about the relationship between these layers of rock, and once we understand the relationships, we can start to explain how this sequence will have formed. We're also going to look and see whether there are any structures present. So if we look at this layer here, I'm actually just going to get rid of the text for a second, you can quite clearly see that we have these vertical cracks in this massive layer. And these are going to be what we refer to as joints. So a joint is a crack in a piece of rock where the pieces of rock either side of the crack do not move relative to each other. Now, if you have a crack in a piece of rock and the rocks either side of that crack do move relative to each other, so one of them goes up or down relative to the piece of rock on the other side of the crack, that's something which we refer to as a fault. Another feature that we can look for is something which we refer to as a fold, and this is exactly as it sounds. This is when the layer of rock actually buckles. So you put the layer of rock under pressure and it bends and it produces a fold. And so we'll look for these features in our sequence of rocks because that's also going to be important in us trying to construct our explanation as to how this particular outcrop formed. The final thing we're going to think about, at least for, you know, in this particular slide, is how are these rocks weathering? Because that's going to, to, in some cases, help us to give us additional information. So we can see in this case, if we track the massive layer here, we can see at the top of it we actually have this spike and then we have a drop and then we come back up here and we continue across. So clearly what's happening is the weathering is preferentially exploiting these joints in this layer because they are you know, points of attack essentially for the weathering process. These joints are allowing these pieces of rock where these joints exist to weather out faster. And so the fact that we can see this region of faster weathering here, once again, that's an indicator to a geologist that there's some kind of feature that is being preferentially exploited. And so as a geologist, we need to think, what could that feature be and why is it being exploited? And so, you know, this is just a few of the things that a geologist will look at when we actually approach an outcrop. So if we're thinking about a smaller scale, what kind of things are we looking for? Well, we can see here that we have ourselves a rock. And we can see that this rock consists of pieces of other rocks. Now, instantly, this tells us this has to be a sedimentary rock, and it has to be a type of sedimentary rock called a clastic rock. So each of these pebbles that we can see here is a clast. So a clast is a piece of rock or mineral that's been weathered from an outcrop, so it's fallen off the outcrop, and that clast, that piece, essentially has been transported by either the wind, water, ice, or gravity. It's been deposited, and then this collection of clasts has then been compressed and compacted until it lithifies to form a rock. And so as a geologist, what we're going to do is we're going to look at these class and we're going to start to think about how would we have actually produced this particular type of rock. So let's have a look at what we've got here. Well, we can see here's a Sharpie for scale. And we can see that these are reasonably large clasts. So these are going to be either cobble or pebble sized clasts. Uh, I do apologize. Let me move cobble or gravel sized class. I do apologize. Now, in order to move a piece of rock this big, it's going to require quite a lot of force. And so moving it by the wind isn't really going to be enough because the wind would not be capable of moving something this big. And so this instantly tells us that whatever was moving this sediment has to be either the water, has to be ice, or it has to be gravity. So what else can we see? Well, we can also see that these clasts are rounded. So if you look here, you can see that these clasts do not have any sharp corners to them. 
Typically, the rounder the clast, the longer it's been transported for. And so this means that this rock is unlikely to have formed due to a landslide. Because in the case of a landslide, the landslide occurs, the rock which started at the top of the hill is transported typically several hundred metres to the bottom of the hill, and that's where it's deposited. That's not really that great a distance when it comes to transportation. If you want to round your pieces of rock, your clasts, what you need to do is you need to transport them, you need to give them time to bang against each other, and as they're banging against each other, they're going to knock off the sharp corners and become more rounded over time. And so this would imply that this is probably not a deposit that's been formed due to the transportation of rocks due to gravity, so it's probably not a landslide deposit. So we're narrowing down our possibilities. So this is probably a deposit related to either water or ice. So let's think about ice. Well, what kind of situation would we get ice transporting large amounts of sediment? And the answer is a glacier. So would this be the type of sediment we would get with a glacier? Well, the answer is, yeah, kind of. You can get this type of sediment produced by glaciers. However, typically glacial sediments will often have a lot of very, very fine sediment, which we in geology refer to simply as mud. Okay, this is a sediment where the clasts are so small you cannot see them with the naked eye. Now, what we can see with this uh, particular rock is we can quite clearly see the large clasts, and we can see that in between these large clasts we have a kind of creamy, peachy coloured material, but we can see it looks granular. So we can actually still see that, you know, it's made up of coarser class. It's not super, super fine grained. And so this is telling us that this particular sediment is not very mud rich. There's not a lot of this very, very fine material. And so we can, in all likelihood, discount this sediment as having been formed by a glacier. So that brings us on to pretty much one option as to how the sediment's being moved. And that would suggest either, well, that would suggest water. And then we have to think to ourselves, right, what types of water-rich environments could we form this kind of sediment in? And there's two possibilities. The first possibility is a relatively fast-flowing mountain river. The other possibility is a beach deposit, typically in a beach that's being hit by quite strong waves. And so how would, we dis how would we distinguish between these two? Well, the answer is actually quite straightforward. The beach deposit would have pieces of shell mixed in with the sediment. There would be bits of fossil mixed in there. And so what we would do as a geologist, we would look at this rock and we would try and find pieces of fossil in there, which would tell us it formed in a beach environment. And if we could, if we could find those pieces of fossil, great, it formed in a beach. If we can't find those fossils, then chances are it probably formed in a mountainous environment, in a relatively fast flowing body of water. So these are some of the observations that a geologist will make to try and work out where our layer of rock formed. So as we can see here, just for comparison, we're going to look at a couple of modern examples. So here we have an example of a sediment that's been deposited by a landslide. We can see it similar to the sediment we were just talking about. We can see it has big clasts, but we can see these clasts are angular. They have lots of sharp corners. And so that would suggest that this steep mountain front deposit, this landslide deposit, is not the type of environment in which this sediment that was later turned into a rock was deposited. Now in contrast we have a river sediment here and this is going to be a river sediment from a mountainous environment. So what can we see? Well we can see right nice well-rounded clasts just like our rock. We can see that in between these bigger clasts we have lots of sandy material which is consistent what, to, with what we just saw in the previous slide. So that so this kind of uh, creamy peachy material here in between these larger clasts, that's sandy. And then as we've discussed we would then look to see what kind of fossils we could find in this piece of rock. If we were finding marine fossils, the kind of ones that we would find in a, in a, in a beach or sea environment, we would assume that this is probably you know, the result of deposition in a beach, or on a beach should I say. Whereas if it's more like this and we can't find any marine fossils, we would probably assume that this layer of rock formed in a, you know, in a river environment in a mountainous terrain.
So you can see how a geologist is going to analyze the rocks and we're going to try and come up with an explanation as to how each layer of rock formed. And then once we understand how each layer formed and we understand the relationships between those layers, then we can put that together to come up with our model as to how our outcrop was, outcrop was produced. So another thing we can do as geologists is we can interpret the landforms that we see. So you can quite clearly see here we have an area of rock and we can see this area of rock has been eroded. And this erosion has produced what's referred to as a mesa. And a mesa essentially is an area of elevated terrain, normally quite large, and it normally has a flat top. Okay. They're not quite as large as a plateau, that's typically a bit bigger, but it's the same kind of basic structure. Now the thing you'll notice about the mesa is that in order for the mesa to form, you have to have eroded the rock around it to actually allow it to stand proud of the surrounding area. Now over time, this mesa is going to be eroded, normally around the edges mostly, and so slowly over time it's going to get smaller and smaller and eventually it's going to form a feature which we refer to as a butte. And over time the butte will also be eroded, erosion will continue from the sides and also from the top, and eventually we'll end up with a group of rocks that just stick out of the area and we refer to those as knobs. And so by simply looking at this transition as a geologist we can think to ourselves, right, this is what I'm seeing, how do I form these? And we can see that over time we're going to essentially progress from one to the next as the uh, weathering of this area of rock becomes more and more extreme. So we're going to start thinking about some of the ways now in which a geologist will analyse a sequence of rocks to try and work out their relationships to each other. Now these are, the, what you're going to see is you're going to see uh, six what we refer to as principles. And these are rules in geology that we use to try and work out where a layer of rock falls in a sequence. So the first principle is the principle of superposition. And this simply says, okay, when we have a sequence of rocks like this, the lower layers must be deposited first and the upper layers must be deposited later. That therefore means that if we look at this sequence of rocks here, this yellow gold colored layer at the bottom must therefore be the oldest, and this pink layer at the top must therefore be the youngest. And so we can apply this back to the picture that we saw in the first slide. So here we go, we can see the layer at the bottom, this rusty red layer here, it's at the bottom of the sequence, so we would assume that that would be our oldest. And this light grey layer at the top here would probably be our youngest. And we can assume this relationship based on the principle of superposition. So yes, so principle of superposition, youngest layer at the top, oldest layer at the bottom. So here's our sequence of rocks again. Can we see anything else though? Well, yes, the next one is the principle of original horizontality. So the principle of original horizontality simply says that when we have layers of sediment being deposited, those layers of sediment will be deposited as horizontal layers. So they will look like this, and then these horizontal layers of sediment will obviously be compacted and turned into sedimentary rocks. And so this means initially when your sedimentary rock forms, it's going to be as a horizontal layer. Now, this means that if I come along later and I see that my layers of sedimentary rock are not horizontal, this means that sometime after the layer of rock formed, it must have been tilted. And so this tells me something. So it tells me, first of all, the sediment was deposited, the layers were lithified to give me the sedimentary rocks, and then the sedimentary rocks were tilted. It's giving me an idea of the history of my outcrop. The next principle is called the principle of lateral continuity. And this simply says that a layer of sedimentary rock will continue laterally in all directions until one of two things happens. The first thing is that your layer of rock will steadily get thinner and thinner and thinner, and eventually it will disappear. In geology, this is called pinching out. 
Because think about it, your layer of sedimentary rock cannot go on forever. Eventually it has to become thinner and disappear. And so what the principle of lateral continuity is saying is that we expect this to happen. It's saying that if you follow a layer of sedimentary rock in an outcrop, eventually, if you were to follow it for far enough, it would disappear and pinch out. The other possibility, though, is that your layer of sedimentary rock could actually terminate against a vertical surface. So if you were to imagine a situation where we have a river valley, and obviously either side of that river valley we have cliffs. Well, when the river floods, it's obviously going to deposit water and sediment over the surrounding floodplain, but the layer of sediment that's being deposited as the river floods will obviously stop against the walls of the valley. And so the principle of lateral continuity is just a way of geologists saying that, right, we understand that every layer of sedimentary rock that we look at will eventually terminate in some way. It will either get thinner and pinch out, or it will stop when it hits a vertical surface. The next principle is the principle of cross-cutting relations, also sometimes called the principle of cross-cutting relationships. And this simply says, when we have a feature, in this case a fault, that's cutting through a sequence of rocks, this feature must be younger than the rocks which it is cutting. So if we look here, we can quite clearly see we have our fault. So if you remember, a fault is where we have a crack in our sequence of rocks, and the pieces of rock either side of that crack have moved relative to each other. So if we look at this grey layer here, we can see the grey layer is coming along quite nicely there, and then all of a sudden it drops down on the other side of the fault. Well, that's telling us that this side of the fault, the right-hand side, has clearly dropped down relative to the left-hand side. And because we have this movement along this crack, that makes that crack a fault. Now, because a fault can't form until the layers of rock are there, obviously the fault must therefore be younger than the layers of rock which it is cutting. So think about it another way. If you're going to cut a birthday cake, you cannot cut the birthday cake until you've made it, can you? And so it's exactly the same principle. The layers of rock have to be there before they can be cut by the fault. And this therefore means that the fault must be younger than the layers of rock which it is cutting. So the principle of superposition says that this layer formed first, this layer formed second, this layer formed third, and then the principle of cross-cutting relationship says each of these three layers was then cut by this fault. And so you can see we are producing a sequential model as to how our sequence of rocks forms. Now, the principle of cross-cutting relationships doesn't just refer to faults. It also refers to other features, such as joints, and it will also refer to a feature which we'll cover more when we look at igneous rocks called a dike. So our next principle is the principle of inclusions. And that simply says, if we have inclusions of a rock, in this case, the grey rock, in another rock, the inclusions, the clasts, must therefore be older. So it's a pretty obvious one. You can't have the pieces of the grey rock in this kind of uh, cream colored rock if the grey rock wasn't there first. Because you need the grey rock to be there, it needs to be weathered and broken down to produce all these pieces, and then this creamy coloured layer of rock needs to be deposited over the top. And so we can quite clearly see when we look at this particular model, the grey rock must therefore be older than the cream coloured rock. Relatively straightforward. So our sixth principle is called the principle of contact effects. It's also sometimes referred to as the principle of baked zones. And so this particular principle is in relationship to intrusions of magma. So as, we, as we've discussed already, sometimes magma will rise through the Earth's crust. Now, about 90% of the time, that magma will actually get trapped inside the Earth's crust. It will never make it to the Earth's surface. So only about 10% of all the magma produced inside the Earth ever makes it to the Earth's surface. The other 90% gets trapped in the crust. So what's going to happen to this magma as it moves through the crust? Well, obviously the magma is going to be very, very hot 
temperature of magma could range anywhere from about 750 Celsius all the way up to temperatures around 1200 Celsius, so, you know, very, very hot. These rocks here, on the other hand, would probably be at temperatures, d depending on the depth, of, let's say, anywhere between about you know, 0 degrees Celsius and about 400 degrees Celsius. So, you know, they are going to be noticeably cooler. Now, the minerals that make up these rocks are going to be perfectly happy at the temperatures which they are at. The problem is, as soon as you, in, as soon as you put a big ball of magma next to them, well, obviously the heat from the magma is going to start warming up the rocks and the rocks are, or more accurately, the minerals in those rocks are going to start becoming unstable and they're going to have to change into new minerals to survive these higher temperatures. This is a type of metamorphism. So what we're seeing here along the margin of this intrusion, which later crystallized to give us a type of rock we call granite, the heat from this granite actually went and baked the rocks along its margin. So these rocks have been metamorphosed due to the heat that came off the magma. And because of that heat, it's caused the minerals in these rocks to change, thereby producing a new rock in the process. And so this is a baked zone. And so what this tells us is we can see that this layer, this layer, this layer, and this layer all have baked zones. So we can see the baked zone here for this layer. We can see the baked zone here for this layer, we can see the baked zone here for this layer, and we can just see the baked zone there for this layer. And so this is telling us that these four layers must have been present before the magma was intruded, because the magma can only bake those layers if they were there before. Okay, so that would mean that these four layers of rock here must therefore be older than the granite which formed from the magma once it had cooled down and solidified. So if we look at this picture, what can, what can we say about it? Well, we can see straight away that we have three distinct layers of rock. So the first layer down here at the bottom is this quite uniform looking layer so it has a very consistent appearance we can see that it has layers to it so it's bedded again and the other thing we can see is that these layers of rock are quite clearly tilted they're not horizontal so remember what i said the principle of original horizontality states that the layers of rock or layers of sedimentary rock should i say when they are initially formed will have been horizontal the fact that these layers of rock are not horizontal tells us that after the rock formed, it must have been tilted. So then what do we see? Well, we see above this tilted sequence down here, we have a horizontal layer of rather sandy looking rock. So we can see, we can see it's quite coarse. We can see, you know, how gritty it looks, but we can see the clasts aren't, aren't particularly huge. So they're what we refer to as sand size clasts. That's going to make this a layer of sandstone right here. Now then above this layer of sandstone, we can see we have a layer of rock where we have these big angular clasts. And so this is going to be a type of rock, which we refer to as a breccia. So what we can see here is we can see we have a sequence of events. So obviously this lower layer must have been deposited first because that's what the principle of superposition tells us. So um, when we look at this layer, we can see it's at the bottom. Principle of superposition therefore says it must have been the oldest layer. So we can see we can say, right, the layer of sediment was deposited. It was compacted. It was lithified, so turned into a rock. Then it was quite clearly tilted. So then what happens? Well, then we have the deposition of this layer of sandy sediment here. Now, if you look very, very carefully, you can see within this layer of sandy sediment, we actually have pieces of this lower layer. So that's the principle of inclusions uh, coming in now. So the principle of inclusions say that because we have pieces of this lower layer in the sandy layer, well, that therefore means that this lower layer must have been there first. And so this helps to back up the assumption we made using the principle of superposition. So then on top of our sandy layer, we can quite clearly see we then have this sequence of breccia. And so you can see principle of superposition says, right, we are going from this layer to that layer to that layer. 
So we're getting younger as we go up. But we can also come up with our, um, our model for how this forms. So what we have is we have a situation where this layer of sediment was deposited. It was lithified to give a horizontal layer of rock. That horizontal layer of rock was then tilted. And this tilted sequence of rocks was then exposed to the atmosphere and it was eroded, it was weathered. And in the process of being weathered, it produced these little pieces of rock that we can see here. And these little pieces of rock were then incorporated into this sandy layer when it was deposited. And then later on, after this sandy layer was deposited, the system became very, very energetic. So we can tell that because when you look at the size of these clasts, you can quite clearly see they're big. And so this is obviously going to require a lot of energy to move class of that size. So once again, we need some kind of very energetic process to make this type of rock form. So once again, we're going back to it could be a glacier, could be landslide deposits, could be something like a very fast flowing mountain river or a, a beach with very, very strong waves. Now, if we actually look at this particular rock here, what we'll see is that the class are very, very angular. So. If we go all the way back, what we will see is that it looks suspiciously like this layer of rock right here, doesn't it? So this layer of rock formed in a steep mountain environment. And so that would suggest that the layer of rock we're looking at at the top of the picture also formed in mountainous terrain. And so that would suggest that when this layer of rock was forming, this area was mountainous. And these sediments were probably being deposited due to landslides coming off the coming off this mountainous terrain. And so you can see that we've started to come up with our story to explain the sequence of rocks that we're looking at. And this is the primary goal of a geologist to be able to explain and be able to defend your explanation in order to um, in order to you know, work out how an outcrop of rock formed. Okay, thanks for sticking with me everybody and I hope you enjoyed this presentation.